Hey guys, thanks so much for tuning in to this week's edition of the Original Strength Podcast. We have a very special guest today, uh, author James Nestor, the author of Deep, Free Diving Renegade Science and What the Ocean Tells Us About Ourselves, and the author of Breath, The New Science of a Lost Art. James, thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Oh, thanks a lot for having me. Hey, listen, man, I, I got to tell you, I'm I'm a huge fan. Uh, one, you've got a tremendous writing style, but two, you seem to be an all-in kind of guy. <laughs> um, <laughs> you you don't just research things; you you experience it. Like you do, you you go after the data, but then there's something about you that drives you. I, I don't know what it is, but you are all in. Um, I'm fascinated by everything that you've been putting yourself through. Have Have you always been like that? <laughs> <laughs> not not really you know i'm not that way around around the house or or normally but i think with stories it's a very different thing for me because i came to journalism out of my love of writing about interesting people and interesting things and i had a real job quote unquote for for decades before i I switched and I just wrote stories on the side. And to me, to be able to open a door into a different world that you knew nothing about was the biggest privilege in the world. And to be able to explore these worlds with people, understand their stories and come out with some knowledge that may be able to help other people, I don't take that lightly. So when I enter into a subject that I'm gonna spend years studying and researching, I wanna understand every single aspect of it. I don't want to just look at it from one way. I want to understand the complete story so that I can construe that and relay that onto other people. Well, you certainly do a fantastic job of telling stories. Um, and it's funny. So we teach breathing in our, in our, our, our workshops mm -hmm. and it's really about the you know, original strength is about helping people return to the bodies that they were born with. And, and so it was fascinating reading breath because you're going through everything, but in so much, so many more nuances than, than I even knew about. And, you know, things we, we, we would do, but not know why we do it or things that we've been observing. And how, how did you get started with that book breath? So it was nothing I really set out to do. I had been hanging out with a bunch of free divers when I was writing deep. And I saw what breathing could do to bring us deeply into the ocean, how it could help us hold our breath for five, six, seven, eight minutes at a time. But I kept hearing these crazy stories of people who were healing themselves by breathing and were heating themselves just by breathing. And it sounded wild enough. And these people weren't really fringy characters. Some of the people telling me these stories were doctors you know, lawyers, accountants. And so while I was writing deep, I was also just at the same time collecting these stories and trying to process everything that breathing could do out of the water, you know. And finally, that file in my office just grew so large. And I had talked to enough scientists and researchers in the field that I thought that there was something there. But the the funny thing that happened along the way is I wrote this proposal, that's what you do in nonfiction. You write a proposal, you sell that proposal, and then you get a little bit of money to go out just so you're hungry and so you finish the book. But I had to throw out everything uh, in the proposal, six months of work, and start over again once I started really getting deeply into this subject and understanding so much of what I thought I knew about breathing was 100% wrong. Wow. So because you brought it up, I'm going to switch tracks just a little bit deep you you started that because you were going you were researching free diving is that correct that's right yep and then you got fully immersed in free diving even swimming with sperm whales and bull sharks mm. yeah and then, again this wasn't uh, you know you can have the the best laid plans going into these projects but the story really takes you where the story wants to go and you just have to have the the endurance and curiosity to keep going and see where it's going to end up. So I had zero intention of free diving myself. I had seen it in competitions. Okay. It was both glorious when these people can dive down 300, 400 feet, come up, and it was absolutely horrifying seeing the people who don't make it, 
who came up dead for a couple minutes until they were resuscitated. I said, this is like such a special thing that has just been corrupted by competition. So luckily I was able to get to know some other free divers who understood it very differently and to go into their worlds and understand free diving in a completely different way. So along the way, you know, you can only spend so many months on the side of a boat watching these people have these incredible experiences with dolphins, sharks, other oceanic animals, and just sit there. And after a while, I just started feeling like a fool if I was going to understand the subject and really write about it. I needed to do it. I couldn't just sit at the surface. I needed to to go deep. And um, so luckily I had some of the best trainers in the world at my disposal, <laughs> you know, and they they showed me the ropes of, of how to do it. So I, I didn't intend to read deep, but I, I was curious and a friend, uh, they, they, they thought I would like it. And and I did it on Audible. But once I started listening to it within two days, I was I, I mean, I it sucked me in. It was fantastic. Let me ask you, how how deep have you dived? So one of the things that these free divers, not the competitors, these more philosophical and med- meditative free divers told me early on was that you should not pay attention to your dive watch. Mm. You shouldn't pay attention to how deep you go, how long you're under there. The second you start doing it, you start thinking, oh, I'm going to go a little deeper. I'm going to stay down a little longer. That's the second you get in trouble because your body changes day in, day out, depending on what you eat, how you slept. So one day you'll be able to go down, you know, 100, 200 feet, be able to stay underwater for four or five minutes. The next day, maybe you don't. And our bodies are really good at sensing things. I mean, that's what we've evolved to do is to be acutely aware of everything happening, all these different functions within ourselves. And the key is to listen to that. So to not pay attention to your watch, to listen to your body, your body will let you know when it's time to come up. And this is why so many competitors get into trouble. They're not listening to their bodies. They're following along with this rope and saying, I have to get to the end of the rope no matter what my body is telling me. So having said that, that big caveat, I, you know, I've probably gone down, not, not very deep, but definitely deep enough to, to understand what freediving is 70, 80 feet, maybe 90 feet. Wow. Um, and stay down about four minutes. But again, it's it's not it's not about numbers. It's about your experience being in the water, connecting to yourself, connecting to the oceanic life down there. That's that's really what's so special about it. Do you do you still free dive? Oh, as much as I can. The problem is I live in San Francisco and the free diving here is is awful. So I only really get to do it when I travel and my life is set up to be on the road half the year. And now because of the pandemic, I'm not going anywhere. So I'm not free diving. Um, luckily, there's still surf out here and I'm getting in the water every day or every other day. But but not a lot of free diving. But it is it is not something I gave up after I finished that book and moved on. It is a, a very important part of my life. Uh, I love the culture. I love being so immersed in, in such a quiet place in the water. There's no phones down there. There's no anything else. There's no emails. You're just so deeply connected with yourself and with the planet. Um, that's what I find so special about it. So I was just going to ask you if if you thought you could describe it. And I, I have a sense, though, that it's 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 as much spiritual as it is physical. Oh, for sure. Um, you know, some people may not understand it that way or appreciate it in that way. And that's fine. I would say meditative rather than spiritual brings, brings, you know, some, some religious connotations to it. Uh, but, but it is a, you know, it is the deepest meditation that, that I've ever fallen into because you can't do it anxious. You can't do it with your mind racing, with your body sort of disconnected from your thoughts. You have to go into yourself and focus on yourself to really free dive. So it's a forced meditation. Um, and I've meditated some, you know, I've, I prefer breathing and to me, breathing is a meditation in and of itself, but there's something about free diving that, you know, you, you can't really go halfway into it. You have to 
commit the time and energy and focus to this task. And we so rarely are given that opportunity to do that in the modern world. We're constantly distracted and there's no real distractions down there once you're doing it right. That sounds amazing, actually. And I can see how you can't be anxious and be free diving. That would that would suck. Yeah. I mean, you, you can. You're just going to stay under for 15 seconds and go down six feet, you know. I've seen people try to push themselves down. There's There used to be abalone diving here, and now all the abalone are, are gone, which is so sad. That was one of my favorite things to do. And you see these people who aren't connected to the ocean, who are coming from inland, just trying to force themselves deeper and deeper and deeper, and it never works out. I mean, these guys get hurt all the time. You you have to submit to the greater power and energy, which is the ocean. It's always going to win, okay, if you fight against it. And that's something uh, any surfer will tell you. You Once you wipe out, you have to submit to it. The second you start fighting against it, you're toast. Mm. So I got I got to ask you because you wrote in, about this in pretty good detail. But what is it like to swim with sperm whales and feel their clicks and the way they communicate and stuff? Well, I had studied sperm whales for months before I was given the opportunity to do it. But over the years in which I was writing and researching deep, I talked to people, and not many people have done this. Okay. So it's like this secret special club, but when they started every single person, when they started talking about it, they just kind of got the chills and they, their eyes glazed over. And it was like, they were reliving some spiritual out of body experience. And I said, wow, I want to have that experience. You know, <laughs> we tried a few, few places, went on a few trips, even stuff that didn't make it into deep at the end, but finally lucked out, went to Sri Lanka. And, you know, a lot of people think that diving with sperm whales, oh, I'm going to take a week off. I'm going to hire this guy, get on this boat and dive with sperm whales. Good luck with that. This is, it is so difficult to find these animals and then to have them be curious enough to want to interact with you. It takes weeks and weeks of grinding work, but luckily we were able, we lucked out after about five, six days of misery, um, 12 hours a day on the ocean, no shade in this teeny little duct tape boat. Um, and finally we're able to get in the water and, and just meet these creatures eye to eye on, on their terms. And it's, it's something I'll never forget and it's it's something that i look forward to repeating it sometime as soon as this pandemic sort of sweeps through if it ever sweeps through i've got two trips planned I'm not going to write about them I'm not going to take any pictures i just want to go and have that experience and connect with these animals again that's awesome do you, you seem when you wrote about them uh, it it had a it seemed like that you you have a sense of awe about them to the point where well i'll just ask you do you do you think they are smarter than people? I think if you look at this animal, it's been around for, what, tens of millions of years, in its same size, with its same brain case, same same brain size, six times the size of ours. Um, they have many structures in their brains, uh, spindle cells, uh, prefrontal cortex, areas that are so much more developed well-developed than ours. We've had our current brain size for, for what, 300,000 years. They've had theirs for tens of millions of years. I mean, just do the math there and you see what great stewards they were of their environment, right? Mil millions of years go by, everything's in balance. And that to me is a real sign of intelligence, not how much we can screw up our home, our environment, but how well we can preserve it. Um, so, you know, it's, it's hard to to measure human intelligence versus another animal intelligence. But I know from every single person that I've ever talked to who has swam with them, and, and I know from my own experience, you're in the water, this animal can kill you in 30 different ways, okay? <laughs> you're, you're 10 feet away from them, they have eight inch long teeth, so they, they could chomp you, hit you with their flukes, smother you, they're the size of a school bus, you know, 150,000 pounds. Like they could destroy you and they, they choose not to. They choose to, after what we've done to them, for them to come up and approach us in peace and be curious and start clicking us, throwing out communication clicks. I mean, 
if that isn't an olive branch, I, I don't know what is. And, and I certainly hope one day we'll be able to understand them a little better before they're all gone. I think one of the most beautiful parts when you were in the water with them in the book, uh, your, uh, the lady that was with you told you to, that they could read your intentions, uh, <laughs> told you to, to be calm and, and just relax. Uh, it, it, but it was the way, the way you, she phrased that I thought was really awesome. Well, if, if you think about a dog, right, a dog can spy a creep from a mile away and will start barking and getting very nervous. It's how you move your body and your intentions will then be reflected in much of your posture, right? So a dog or, or so many other animals, there's, there's a reason why there are horse whispers or wolf whispers who can come up to wild animals and in an extremely calm way. So yeah, she was saying because these animals with their clicks, they can click through you. They can see you have lungs. They can see you have hair. They can see you have a large brain. So we know all that. Um, but she, she had just mentioned, she's like, have, have good intentions and, and trust the moment here. And because if you don't, if you start freaking out, they're either going to get nervous or they're going to feel threatened. So it was another reason to really go inside and say, Hey, I'm in a situation I'm never going to be in again in again, probably. So now is the time to really do it and to show this animal that we're not all bad, right? I mean, you think about their, the only thing they know of humans is from boats and from harpoons. Uh, they don't see humans in the water, maybe on the surface, scuba diving, splashing around, or, or uh, you know, scuba diving with a bunch of bubbles, which they hate, but they don't see humans dive down 50 feet and twirl around and come up and follow them as they take a breath and dive down. So they could have thought we were another life form. I mean, really, because we're free divers are so different than the other humans that they would be seeing. That's awesome. But now you brought me to my favorite topic, superheroes. So clicks, basically you described that them having the powers of Daredevil. Uh, I don't know if you know who Daredevil mm -hmm. is, but he's uh, the blind superhero who can see everything um, <laughs> and sense everything. And you mentioned that there are people that walk around that can do the same thing using clicks themselves. Yeah, Daniel Kish and Brian Bushway. I'm supposed to talk to Brian today. So another privilege of my job is I get to meet these people. And, and then if I'm lucky, I get to stay in contact with them after I'm done writing with them. So these guys are my personal heroes. They're both completely blind, not legally blind, like 100% blind but they've allowed themselves, they've willed themselves to be able to essentially see through clicks, just like a bat sees through echolocation or a dolphin sees through echolocation or a whale sees through echolocation. They can do the same thing um, to the extent that these guys ride their bikes around Los Angeles, <laughs> click, <laughs> clicking. And I mean, these are people who are dealt a tough hand, but said, screw it, I'm going to make the best of this. And they travel alone, they camp alone, and they're really, it just shows you what the human body is capable of if you really focus on it, if you get rid of all the distractions in the modern world and let your body do what it naturally wants to do, which is adapt. So i got to ask you this because you experience everything you come across. Have you tried to learn how to click with your, without vision? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I was doing that at Brian Bushway's house. Um, he <laughs> gave me a really quick instruction and you would be amazed how quickly it, it turns on. Um, you know, I wasn't able to spot a tennis ball from a Rubik's Cube across the table, which he he can. But I can I was able to sense a, a general perception of the space around corners are really easy because they have a really distinctive echo to it. Walls, hard walls are really easy, you know, and then there's just slices of subtlety after that. The more you do it, the more you use it, the better you're going to get. And it's interesting to think of, there's uh, several click languages, right? They're, they're in Africa. I think there's some in Indonesia where there's a lot of... And you wonder if these languages developed to allow these people to see better in the dark. Um, because there, there was no electricity for, you know, until... 50 years ago in, in some of these villages. And so it just brings up some questions about all the abilities that, that maybe humans are losing right now in the modern age. So you completely convinced me that people can do these things. So for, for a few days, uh, 
over the last week, I've been walking around with my eyes closed, like clicking, trying to figure out if I can see things. And I'm good enough to know that if I'm in a small bathroom or a large room, and that's about it. But but it is amusing to me. Yeah, but imagine if, if you had no option to see, and if this was just what you what you did. Uh, it took Brian Bushway, I think it was after a couple of months, he started literally seeing columns uh, when, when he was walking next to columns. Uh, because he he was sighted until he was like 15 years old, I think, and and then he lost his sight. So, yeah, you know, clicks, uh, echolocation, free diving, we're capable of so much. I think we've been really selling ourselves short in the last century, and it's nice to see people regaining this this potential that exists within all of us. It is fascinating, but now I'm going to switch gears and go back to breath, if that's okay. Of course. Sure. So, so in our workshops, we, we tell everybody that they need to keep their tongue on the roof of their mouth and breathe through their nose. And they oftentimes they ask why, and I'm like, well, that's the way you were born. We, that's how we come into the world. So it must be the design. Uh, and now you, you completely dove into everything in breath, but I've got to ask you, you did mouth breathing, solely mouth breathing with your nose plugged up for a month. What? Yeah, ten what days. Was... Ten. It wasn't quite a month. It was oh god! Good. Cause I was like, man, that sounds horrible. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, there was talk of us doing it for a month, and I just knew that that was untenable. It wasn't going to happen. So I had been talking with the chief of rhinology research at Stanford. Great guy, Jack Arnayak, uh, one of the real leaders in the field. We had several lunches, long interviews. He told me all about the wonders of the nose and how bad mouth breathing was. And no one can really refute that. The science is very clear, but nobody really knew how quickly this damage came on. So no one had tested it. So I convinced him to test it. And he said, okay, let's do an experiment. Uh, why don't you plug your nose for a month? I said, nope. Not going to happen, but I'll do it for 10 days. That's that's about the limit I, I thought that I or anyone else could tolerate it. But what's interesting about this is this, I know it sounds like some sort of jackass stunt to do, but it really wasn't. That was never the intention. The, the point of it was to lull ourselves into a position that we already knew. So many of us are mouth breathing anyway, and 25 to even 50% of the population habitually mouth breathes. So the only difference was we were just putting ourselves just like so much of the population, but the difference was we were measuring what happened to our bodies and brains and everything else. And, and that's why we approached it as a, as a really strict, serious scientific experiment, not as a stunt at all. What were some of the, because it reminded me of that documentary, Super Size Me, when the guy wanted to live off of McDonald's every day. But you had some pretty uh, significant physical changes with that, didn't you? Yeah, and Super Size Me, I, I don't know if anyone's actually eating McDonald's every day for a month, right? So that is an, a very extreme way of eating. What we were doing really wasn't extreme. You talk to people with chronic sinusitis. You talk to people who have had their noses bashed in several times who can't breathe properly. And, you know, we were just really putting our, ourselves into a, into a, a place where, where so many other people were so familiar with. So it was really bad. We knew it was going to be not pleasant. We didn't know it was going to be this bad. And <laughs> within like a few hours at Stanford's about 40, 30 minutes away from my house here in San Francisco. So drove back. We're like, yeah, this sucks. Ate food. We're like, oh, can't taste anything. That's weird. Went to sleep that night. And for the first time that I've known of, uh, I was snoring and we have readouts. We have all the data on this and the snoring got worse and worse as the test went on. We started choking on ourselves uh, through sleep apnea. The tongue falls back in the throat, blocks the airway. And so our bodies were just deteriorating. And what was crazy is stress levels up, blood pressure up, cortisol up, like all, all that stuff. But so much of so many of the problems that we were suffering from, like you see reflected in the problems that so many other people are suffering from. A lot of these things are tied to breathing and nobody realizes it. They're tied to improper breathing at night during sleep. They're tied to improper breathing during the day. 
And we've got pills and powders and tranquilizers and antidepressants to help us deal with it. But so much of this stuff is rooted in breathing. And that's what we really realized. Yeah. So with the pills and the supplements and things that there are out there that really don't address breathing, you found a pretty simple solution, uh, taping your lips shut when you sleep at night. Yeah. I shut my mouth just like any, any mom would, would tell a kid, shut your mouth, S- sit up straight. But uh, I don't have one of these really powerful jaws. I have a, a, a rather weak jaw. And so it's very hard for me to close my mouth when I'm sleeping. And I had thought it was normal over the past few decades to just wake up throughout the night, drink a bunch of water, go back to bed, wake up, mouth dry, drink a bunch of water. But that's not normal. That means you're sleeping with your mouth open. And that is so bad. It's so injurious to the body to expose your lungs constantly to unfiltered, unheated, unmoistened air. So by simply using a teeny piece of tape, this is not a fat strip of masking tape. This is the smallest little piece of tape just to train the jaw shut. I'm able to sleep only breathing through my nose. And guess what happened? That first night, my snoring went down, what, ninefold. Next night, I wasn't snoring at all. I haven't snored since. I haven't had sleep apnea since. And I record myself regularly, all my sleep data. So just by shifting the pathway through which air comes in, and I don't see this as being anything any doctor is talking about, how mouth breathing is directly implicated in snoring and sleep apnea. And those two things, snoring and sleep apnea, are causing so much damage in mil- tens of millions of people in the U.S. alone. We're just starting to understand how injurious both those conditions are. Oh, it's, it, and it goes so much even bigger than that. I mean, and you've seen it. Like, so people that with their mouth, if they breathe with their mouth open, it's typically the tongue's not resting on the roof of the mouth. So they have forward head carriage or, or they're stressed out because your breath is like the switch between your autonomic nervous system between fight or flight or rest and digest. So like they're always walking around in a, in a state of emergency, kind of. That's, that's exactly right. And a lot of people have said, well, it's easier to get air in through my mouth, yeah. and w- which is 100% true. It is. And you know what? That's a problem because there's a reason that we have all of these sinuses. There's a reason when I take an inhale through my nose, it takes a while for that air to get in. And when I exhale, it takes a while for that air to get out. It's that time and that pressure that air in our lungs that allows us to absorb so much more oxygen. So we get 20% more oxygen per breath by breathing through our nose than our mouths. You think that's not going to make a difference to you in your life? You are absolutely crazy. This is the, the essential foundation to not only good breathing, but to health is you have to breathe through your nose, period. That's it. That's it. That is awesome. Let me ask, so in the book, you, I can't, I think you kind of pretty much start out with that humans are the worst animal breathers of all. And, and it, because of the narrow, uh, well, mouth breathing, narrow nasal passages. And can you go into that just a little bit, how that shapes the jaw? Yeah. If you look at animals in the wild, I mean, watch a cheetah, not only sleeping its mouth shut, but watch it hunting prey. Its mouth is closed the entire time. Watch any horse in a sprint. Mouth is shut, breathing only through the nose. A horse is in trouble if it's mouth breathing. So this is true for, you know, the 5,400 different mammals out there. These, we are obligate nasal breathers. This is how we begin. This is how we're supposed to breathe. That's why we've developed the most intricate organ in the front of our faces, all those sinuses, that nose, to breathe in through our nose. So, you know, I I think that you have to start with that with with nasal breathing and i think that once you acknowledge that and start using it the benefits of that really come uh be, become apparent very very quickly i gotta ask you you in your research you experienced a lot of breathing techniques uh alternate nostril breathing buteco breathing uh, holotropic breathing are there any of those that you practice regularly that you found that were like just really for you the thing that was just the wow yeah, I think that if you start to look at 
at breathing right now, actually at any time, there's different peoples that have adopted different methods and different cultures at different times. But what I found in the book, which is exactly why I didn't get into too many of these specific breathing methods, because there's hundreds of them, right? They're all doing the same thing. I put them into two, basically two categories. There's slow and low and light breathing, and there's a zillion different ways to do that. And then there is conscious overbreathing. So, and there are a zillion different ways to do that. You've got pranayama, you've got Wim Hof method, you've got holotropic, you've got Qigong. I mean, it, it goes on and on. But by looking at generally what each of these do, I was able to get a view because there's no coincidence why Wim Hof method, for instance, has the same benefits to so many people as Sudarsh and Kriya because it's doing the same thing. So it's having you breathe very hard to stimulate your sympathetic nervous system <laughs> and then breathe very, very slowly to calm yourself down. And it's conditioning your nervous system so that you can understand that you can control these different aspects in your own body. You know, we've been told that we cannot control the autonomic nervous system. It's been called automatic, as in beyond our control. That is complete BS. We can control it by breathing. So to answer your question specifically, I do so many of these methods. I do very heavy breathing. I call it breathing plus, which is this conscious overbreathing. I, I practice uh, Wim's version of Tumo, uh, you know, he, he is acknowledged. He did not create this stuff. It's thousands of years old. So I do that a few times a week. Um, sometimes I'll do Sudarshan Kriya. I practice nasal breathing all the time. You become a bit of a neurotic if you write a book <laughs> about breathing, which is not a good thing. Don't do it people. But luckily a lot of this becomes habit when I'm working out, especially, I am so conscious of the way in which I breathe. And I heard this from Patrick McEwen. I thought this quote was great. He said, never work out harder than you can breathe correctly. So if you find that you're really sprinting, going for it, you're starting to breathe through your mouth, your breathing's becoming dysfunctional, you need to slow down and work yourself up to that point. And you will see huge benefits from doing this. And I've certainly seen that even while surfing, you know, water sports aren't the great, greatest thing for nasal breathing, <laughs> salt water in your nose all the time. But I've managed to, you know, a system that I can nasal breathe a lot when I'm out there. And I've definitely felt the difference. I do think that if you use your mouth as the governor, so when it pops open, that means you need to take a break or slow it down. I, I think if you do that, it makes the, I don't know if you've heard of the Maffetone method, but it, to me, it kind of just makes it like a not, you know, like just so easy to do because you don't even have to count anything or, or be aware. you like, when the mouth pops open, okay, I've reached that point. I need to slow it down. That's, that's exactly right. And you know what I've told people, <laughs> uh, some people have written who have said like, oh my God, I was laughing today. I noticed I took a couple breaths through my mouth. <laughs> I'm like, oh God, I've created complete neurotic people here. Uh, I point, I tried to make very clear in the book, but in the next edition, I'm going to make it even clearer is that it is perfectly fine to occasionally breathe through your mouth. We're able to do that. When your nose gets clogged up, it is perfectly fine. I'm talking about chronic breathing. I'm talking about chronic mouth breathing is bad. So if you're laughing right now, we're talking. I've taken a lot of breaths through my mouth. I've you know, been doing about five or six interviews a day, and I feel crappy at the end of the day because I'm mouth breathing so much. But that's not going to really hurt my long-term health to take a few hundred breaths through your mouth out of 25,000 you're taking in the day. That is perfectly fine. But when you're working out, uh, specifically to what you're saying, I think it's a, yeah, Phil Maffetone was was onto this stuff in the 70s, you know? And his whole deal was you have to build the aerobic base. All these people going from sitting on a couch to going and, and doing CrossFit, like they're going to hurt themselves and they're going to be in worse shape at the end of it. You have to very gently and slowly build that base. And the moment you start mouth breathing where you just can't feel you can go any further, you're likely going to be entering into that anaerobic zone. And for Maffetone and Duyar and all those other trainers, that was bad news. So he would have, to have them pull back and build their aerobic base. So uh, I think when your mouth slackens open, I think that that's a great sign. Take a break or slow it down. 
Right on. All right. So I don't want to take too much more of your time, but I got to ask you one more thing about uh, the Tibetan rites. Mm -hmm. Do you still participate in those? Oh, yeah. Uh, I try to do them about four, four or five times a week um, when I can get to it. <laughs> but, you know, something I wanted to make clear in the book, too, is that story about how they're going to help you live forever, that is very likely apocryphal, okay? <laughs> it probably didn't happen, so don't don't sue me if, if you die uh, after you've been practicing these. What I thought was interesting about the story is these rites have been around for thousands of years, and they found that they can help expand lung capacity. We know that larger, healthier lungs will help you live a longer life. We, we know that to be true. So it's however you can get that. Other yoga poses are great for that as well. I love the rites because um, they're, they're great poses. They're great stretches. I feel great afterwards. I'm sure there are other stretches and poses that work just as well, but I've got these tattooed to my brain and, you know, why not? They've been practiced for, for so many thousands of years. They obviously had some benefit for the monks who use them. And, and, uh, I think that I always, I always feel calmer afterwards. So listen, man, they, they inspired me to write a whole book based yeah. off of them. So I, I totally get it. <laughs> I got to get that book. I didn't know that. Oh, wow. Yeah, uh, okay. I'll, I'll send it to you. <laughs> awesome. No, I'd love to read it. Yeah. So are you younger though? Have you noticed, uh, that you like, cause the whole thing about the, the rights were, I, and yes, I, I do know that they won't let you live forever, but do you feel younger? Can't you tell? I'm I, extremely handsome right now. Very spry. You can't well, see, no, no, I have no idea. No one has any idea. You know, it would be interesting to, to actually do a test, to, to take people and have two, two groups of subjects and have one half of them do the right. And after six months, do, do some metrics, take, take blood, take CAT scans and, and just see what happens. You know, I, they certainly can't hurt anything. The rights cannot hurt anything. I don't think people should fall into the the false promise or premise that they may help you live forever, but they absolutely have a benefit to to your breathing and they're they're great stretches. So that's worth doing them in and of itself. Right on. James, thank you so, so much for for having this conversation with me. I really appreciate it. This has been fascinating to me. You are a tremendous author. Uh, I love, again, how you just dive all in into what you're researching. I mean, you're like Indiana Jones. <laughs> uh, well, thank thank you very much. I, I really, really appreciate that. I, I never take this job for granted. I, um, I love what I do. And part of that is to be so insatiably curious about subjects that I feel have been either misrepresented in some way or convoluted and, and to bring those to people. And I, I tell you, no one had any idea what was going to happen with this book, especially the breath book, releasing it in a pandemic. And what a thrill it is to find people as excited about this research as I've been for the past few years. And, uh, you know, to be spreading the word and try to get this stuff out there because breathing is free. Anyone can do it anywhere. And the science has clearly shown you can gain some really tremendous benefits from doing it correctly. Yes. And so, hey, guys, if you are listening to this, I will put the links to both uh, books, Deep and Breath, uh, in the notes of this uh, podcast. And you have to do yourself a favor. Get the book Breath. It is life changing. It it will ch that book alone. If you just practice what James is telling you in that book, it will absolutely change your life forever. James, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank, this was awesome. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. We hope you've enjoyed this edition of the Original Strength Podcast.